You may be seated. All right. Good morning, church. Good to see all of you. If uh, we have not had the privilege of meeting yet, my name is Chad, and I am the pastor here at IFC. Yes, children, you've got the hint before I even had to announce it. They really did not want to stay in here. I don't know what that means for the rest of you, and I apologize. We're going to be back in the book of Colossians. If you have your journals that we handed out last week, and I hope that you do, or a Bible that you are carrying with you, if you are new with us this week and you're visiting for the first time and you would like one of these, uh, this is our gift to you as we go through the book of Colossians. This is just simply the Word of God with the opportunity to journal and write notes next to it. And so if you want one of those, just shoot your hand up in the air. We have a couple of people that will hand those out. And we just want to put that in your hands so that you can study and follow along with us as we journey through the book of Colossians. If you were with us last week, we looked at the first two verses, and we looked at the Apostle Paul primarily. And we looked at a life that was captivated by Jesus Christ, a life that had Jesus Christ in first place. And as we study through the book of Colossians, it's my hope and prayer that Jesus Christ would become first place in our own lives, that he would have first place in our lives, our marriages, our church, and that that would overflow into bringing the gospel to the people of this island. And so we're going to continue on in verses 3 through 8, and really what today we are looking at is this, when the gospel comes to a people, when the gospel comes to a people. And we are going to be looking at these verses, and this is really the Apostle Paul retelling how it is that the church at Colossae came to be. And it started with a humble beginning with one man that was willing to bring the good news back to his city, and then it became the church at Colossae that we know today that the Apostle Paul is writing to in this book of Colossians. And so our text for today says this, We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, of this you have heard in the word of the truth, the gospel, which has come to you, as indeed in the whole world it is bearing fruit and increasing, as it also does among you, since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God in truth. Just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant, he is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf and has made known to us your love in the Spirit. And before we get too far in today, would you please just join me in a word of prayer? Father, I thank you for this text that you have planted us in today. Father, I thank you for the people of IFC. Father, I pray that as the gospel came to a people in Colossae, that it would be the same for us today, that the gospel would come to people all over this island, and that you would be gracious enough to use us right here in this room to play our part. We pray that in a mighty way, in a way that nobody could get the credit or the glory for except for you, that people would come to know Jesus Christ, Father, that as we leave this place week after week, we wouldn't just be content to sit and wait for the next Sunday, but that we would be on mission all week long. That we would see people that are in desperate need of the hope that the gospel offers. That we would just be faithful ambassadors for you. Father, would you work in a way that only you can work. And I hope and pray that we would give you the glory and honor that you deserve. And we pray this all in your son's perfect and holy name. Amen. And so what we are looking at in these first in these five verses is this. We are looking at gospel multiplication. And gospel multiplication requires two things. And it's very simple. It is this. They require the gospel message and it requires a gospel messenger. And so how does the gospel spread throughout the book of Acts? How does the gospel spread throughout time as we've witnessed in Christian history? It is through the gospel message being faithfully proclaimed by gospel messengers over and over and over again. That there is no other remedy, there is no other way that the gospel spreads other than people like you and me from all different places and stations coming into a place and bringing the good news to people 
that are in need of it. This is the wonderful thing about the gospel message is that it doesn't require a certain pedigree. It doesn't require a certain uh, person or personality, but that each and every single one of us, we are able to play our own part in bringing the gospel to a group of people. And if you look around this room today, and however many there are of us, if each and every single one of us is faithful to bring the good news of the gospel that we hold dear to the people that we come in contact with on this island week after week, can you imagine the multiplication that might take place? And here's the important thing for us to remember as we work through this text today, that our job as gospel messengers is nothing more than proclaiming the good news that we've been entrusted with. And we'll leave the results up to the Lord. And we'll leave the results up to the Lord. And so we find this in our text. We find the gospel and we find the gospel messenger. And this is Epaphras who brought the good word, the good news to the people of Colossae. Many people think that he probably heard the good news by the Apostle Paul when he was preaching in Ephesus as the Apostle Paul just went on a rampage with the gospel to the point that the book of Acts would tell us that over his time there, there would come a point when nobody in Asia had not heard the good news of the gospel. And this wasn't just from the Apostle Paul, but it was from the gospel multiplication. That is, the Apostle Paul shared the gospel, and people came to hear and then understand the gospel. They would then take the gospel back to where they came from. And so the gospel ministry, friends, is simply this. It's proclaiming the good news, and it's not just for somebody like me or Mike or Maynard or any of the other brothers that might occupy this pulpit on a Sunday morning. The gospel ministry is for all of you. And what I hope to do with my time today, if I can, is to simply stir you up and then send you out. And so while I'm excited to be here and to be a part of the gospel ministry of IFC, I am not the entire gospel ministry of IFC. It will not work. It will not be sustainable. But if we all join arms together and we all get fired up about the good news of Jesus Christ, well then, that is sustainable. And that is what it would look like to be a faithful minister. And so we continue looking at this, but what is the gospel message? And the reason I want to do this, and many of you might understand the gospel, you might go, well, I've heard that my whole life, Chad. I've been in the church. I get the gospel. Here's what I know to be true. And I've spent a lot of time in churches. I grew up in the church. I started preaching when I was 12, and so I've ran into a lot of different people. But every person I meet, they either love the gospel or they're in need of the gospel. And so if you love the gospel this morning, then me repeating it to you shouldn't be, oh, he's sharing the gospel again. It should be, this is amazing. I get to relish. I get to remember. This is what we do when we come to the Lord's table. We, we remember the good news of Jesus Christ. And so if your soul doesn't get fired up as we look at the gospel message this morning, then let me just encourage you in this, that you might not completely understand the gospel message. And so you either love the gospel or you're in need of the gospel. Look with me, if you will, in 1 Thessalonians 1, 9 through 10. And the scripture says this, For they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. And so simply put in this text, what is the good news of Jesus Christ? It is that Jesus Christ delivers us from the wrath to come. This is the best news in the world. And I don't know what churches each and every single one of you grew up in, but if you grew up in the type of church I did, the good news was just fire insurance. It was that you got to get out of hell and that you got to go to a place with a golden road and there were some rivers there and it was really nice, but they did not give us a full picture of what we were being saved from. And friends, if you've understood and you've come to know the gospel, what you need to know is that you're not saved just from hell, but you are saved from the wrath of God. It's not that hell was our enemy, it's that we were enemies of God. 
that we are in need of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And this is the good news that we are saved from the wrath of God if we come to Jesus Christ. And how does he accomplish this? What does that actually look like in a tangible way? 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 5. It is the most explicit gospel message really throughout the Scriptures. And Paul is writing it to a church that is in desperate need of remembering what the gospel is. And this Scripture says this, Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance, What I also received, this is the gospel, and it just takes one messenger. The Apostle Paul received the gospel, and then he went on to proclaim the gospel. We looked at this last week. That he was buried, or that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. And so quite simply, what is the good news of the gospel? That Jesus Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. He was buried and he was raised, then he appeared to the twelve. And then the text continues to go on and tell us that he appeared to over 500 other individuals. And why is that important? Because those 500 individuals, starting with the 12, would shake up the ancient world. They would be so on fire for the gospel of Jesus Christ that as much as they wanted to snuff them out, as much as they wanted to get rid of this good news, they would not let it happen. They would be willing to go to the grave with this good news that they found in Jesus Christ. And you know why they were willing to go to the grave? Because it was true. Because it was true. If it was just a story that they got together and said, hey guys, let's come up with this so that we can get some fame, so that we can get ourselves out there, so that we can tell people about our rabbi who's now dead, then I guarantee you, as soon as somebody was threatening them with hanging them upside down on a cross, with chopping their head off, or with boiling them in oil, I don't know about you, And I don't know your limits, but I would have went, all right, you got me. It was his idea. He came up with it. Chop his head off. We'll stop telling the story. But that is not what happened. In fact, what we see in the book of Acts is this, that the disciples went absolutely insane with the good news, even to the point of willing to be beaten And one of my favorite stories in the books of Acts, it's either in chapter 4 or chapter 5, and they bring in the apostles and they beat them, and then they go out and they tell them to stop preaching Jesus, and they say, we can't help but speak of what we've seen and heard. We cannot help but speak of what we've seen and heard. And so they left rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer for the cause of Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul is going to go through all sorts of torment and pain for this good news. He's going to be shipwrecked. He's going to be uh, whipped with 39 lashes over and over again because they knew that 40 would probably kill him, but 39 kept him around a little bit longer. And so this is a gospel. This is the good news that changes people. And that what is wonderful today, friends, is that if you are sitting here today and you know the gospel of Jesus Christ, then you are part of the multiplying ministry that the gospel has done since this text was written. You ever think about that for a second? That the way that you came to know the gospel of Jesus Christ is because someone was willing to share the message with you? They loved you enough to bring you the good news? And so we find our gospel messengers in this text, and it is Paul and Epaphras, And really, Paul is probably the primary person that brought the gospel to Epaphras. But what I want to focus on is this. I want to look really backwards sighted because the Apostle Paul starts with what he's doing as he's writing the letter. And then he's going to go through that. And he's going to lead up to the point where Epaphras brought them the good news. And so what I want to do with our time together today is work through the text But I want to start at the end where they learn the gospel from Epaphras, and then I want to work our way backwards to see why does it lead to the Apostle Paul giving thanks. 
And I think it'll hopefully be helpful for us today. And so when the gospel comes to Colossae, Epaphras brings the good news of the gospel. He is the primary messenger of this church. And he has been reporting and bringing back report to the Apostle Paul. And he's telling them that he's nervous about these false teachers that have came in and crept in and are threatening the gospel that they have heard from him. And so this is why the Apostle Paul is writing this letter to the church at Colossae. He is hoping that as kind of the grandfather of this church, as the one that shared it with Epaphras, and then Epaphras shared it with them, that he can help them and show them and steer them back onto the right way of, hey, Jesus Christ is enough. You don't need to do this and that. You don't need to add this belief system in order to get to heaven. You don't need this uh, way of praying. You don't need to add the Jewish tradition in order to get it all. Jesus Christ is all and He is enough. And so we find this, that the gospel is at the center of our text this morning. And we see that they learned it from Epaphras. And everything that we are going to look at from this point forward in this text is going to flow out of the fact that the church at Colossae learned the gospel from Epaphras. And if I'm being honest, my hope and prayer for us today is that we would be faithful ministers of the gospel like Epaphras. That we would see the need all around this place where we live and that we would step into it and bring the good news of Jesus Christ to a world that is in desperate need of it. And so we continue. They hear the gospel. And in case you didn't know this, if you don't hear the gospel, you can't believe the gospel. And that might sound really simple to some people. And it is really simple, but people miss this all the time. If you do not get the gospel that we just looked at correct, if you do not get that Jesus Christ died for sins, that he was buried and that he rose again, if you do not get that message in there, then you might get people to church, you might get them to think that they're not going to hell, but you have not shared the gospel with them. You have not given them the good news of Jesus Christ. And so when we're telling people about Jesus, we have to make sure we get the gospel right. It's simple. Died for our sins, was buried, and rose again. And if they ask, okay, but why is him dying affect me for my sins? And it's because that he who knew no sin became sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. This is why it is called the great exchange. That Jesus Christ was willing to go to the cross and face sin, death, and the wrath of God so that we could be forgiven, so that we could be given life. This is the good news of Jesus Christ. And if we miss it, we're going to lead people astray. We might give them some self-help. They might even come to church. They might enjoy hanging out with you. But they do not know the gospel. And so they hear it. We see this in verse 6. Since the day you heard it, and then we're going to, I want to show you this, Romans 10, 14 through 17. How then will they call in him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? This is exactly what we were just talking about. How are they supposed to believe if they have not heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us. So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. And so did you catch everything that has to take place? There has to be someone preaching. There have to be people hearing. And then they have to be believing. And the thing before the preaching is, well, how will they be sent? And let me just encourage you this, that if you are a believer in Jesus Christ today, then you have been sent. You've been given the ministry of reconciliation that the Apostle Paul talks about in 2 Corinthians 5. You've been given the great commission in Matthew 28. These are not optional suggestions that he is trying to give to the saints of, hey, if you guys get around to it in the next few thousand years before I come back and you want to go make disciples and preach the gospel, uh, yeah, it would be nice. 
like you, you can try to do that. And we, you know, I'd, I'd appreciate that because I'm awesome and I died for your sins and all of this stuff. Like he's commanding them. Make disciples, make followers of Jesus Christ. And how do they become followers of Jesus Christ? By hearing the good news. And so if you're wondering this morning if you've been sent, I can assure you that yes, you have. If you know the gospel of Jesus Christ and you love the people around you, you will have no problem proclaiming the good news of Jesus. Hebrews 4.2 says this, For good news came to us just as to them, but the message they heard did not benefit them because they were not united by faith with those who listened. This is referring to the Israelites who, as you know, they were brought out of Egypt and they had this wonderful promise in the promised land, but then because of their grumbling and their stubbornness and their disobedience, they would not inherit the promised land. And so what is the difference between those who believe And the people that the author of Hebrews is writing to here, the message they heard, and so they heard it, just like each and every single one of us have heard the gospel, but it did not benefit them. And so what is the difference between when somebody hears the gospel and it benefits them versus somebody hearing the gospel and it not bringing any benefit into their life? I believe our text in Colossians shows us this, and it's this, that the people that benefit from the gospel are the ones that understand the grace of God. And so the difference between somebody, if I go out to the street corner today after the service and go, do you know Jesus Christ? He died on the cross. He died on the cross for your sins so that you can have a relationship with him because you're a sinner. He was buried and then he raised again. If I go out and give them the gospel in a nutshell, Yes or no, does it benefit them? It depends on if they understand it. Otherwise, they might have heard it, but if they do not understand the grace of God, then they miss the benefit. Look at this with me in our text that we're looking at today. As it also does among you since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God in truth. And so two things, they heard the gospel from Epaphras, and then they also understood the gospel. And husbands, I'm going to talk to you for a second, but if your wife has ever talked to you for a long period of time and you've spaced out and you've heard everything go in one ear and out the other, you know the difference between hearing and understanding. And wives, if you're going, that's never happened to him, then you, you've got a saint you should take him out for lunch or just treat him very nicely over the next week because God bless your husband. And wives, the same is true for you, right? If he's talking about a project that you just don't care less about because he's got a bunch of other projects that he's not getting done, and so it goes in one ear and out the other, and you hear everything he says, and you might even be looking at him and going, yeah, honey, yeah, that sounds nice. Yeah, that's great. And then he stops talking, and you kind of have a a panic moment. You're like, What was he saying for the last 15 minutes? Projects. Uh, Yes, yes. There's a difference between hearing and understanding. And so our job as Christians is to make sure that they hear. We leave the results up to God. John Stott would put it this way, that our job is to simply proclaim the good news and leave conversion up to the Lord. And I think this is really important because I think there are a lot of people in a lot of churches today that are afraid to bring the good news to people that don't know it because they're worried that somehow they're going to be rejected or that they're somehow going to mess up the good news. And friends, let me just encourage you with this this morning, that if you can faithfully share the good news of what Jesus Christ has done and accomplished with his work on the cross, his obedient life, then it's just like sharing any other news. It's sharing that there was an earthquake last night. Sharing that your spouse is doing great. Like It's just sharing news. 
And, and like I said last week, we share what we love because what's in our heart comes out of our mouths, whether or not we want to admit that. And so if you can bring the gospel to people, regardless of whether or not they proclaim and accept Jesus Christ right there on the spot and bow the knee to Jesus, you will still be successful. And keep sharing and keep praying and keep bringing the good news to people. You never know which soil it might land on. And so he brings the good news. They hear the gospel. They understood the grace of God. And look with me in our text. They find hope in God. And this is important. If you share the good news of Jesus Christ, or perhaps you've heard a gospel illustration, but it does not lead you to hope, then I would argue that you have not heard the gospel. If it somehow brought you into legalism or th do this and don't do that, and it's this joy-sucking way of life, and it's not this hope-filled, wonderful spring of, I, I can't wait to be with Jesus. Yeah, I'm living for him now, but it's going to be so much better when I get to see him face to face. If you have not experienced that, if you have not found hope in the gospel of Jesus Christ, then you probably have not found the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because the good news of Jesus is full of hope. And notice what happens as these believers, they find a hope in the gospel of Jesus Christ and it changes everything. It changes absolutely everything for them. And I want to look at the triad of Christian graces. And if you are familiar with church at all, you're going to recognize these other two as soon as the first one came on top. You could probably shout them out to me because we are familiar with these three words. But the triad of Christian graces in this particular text, it begins with the hope that they find in the gospel, and then it leads to faith in Jesus Christ. Look at this in the text. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. And so why do they have faith in Jesus Christ? Why do they have love for the people around them? because of the hope that they have laid up for them in heaven. The hope that they have heard in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And why is the Apostle Paul thanking God for this? If you've paid attention to our text throughout the day, you'll see this, that he gives thanks for two things. The faith that they have in Christ Jesus and the love that they have for the saints. What's the reasoning? Why isn't he saying, hey, good job, church? You've got wonderful faith and you're loving the saints so well. Good job, A+. Plus. Why is he not doing that? I would make the case that both faith and love are a gift from the Lord. And so as the Apostle Paul gives thanks to God, he is reminding them simultaneously while thanking God that the faith that you possess and the love that you have started with the Lord. It came from God. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says this, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works so that no one may boast. And so we've been saved through grace by faith, and this is so that we can't boast. And if we looked at Romans 4, if we had the time together today, and then Romans 5, we see this wonderful picture that the Apostle Paul is writing to Rome, and he's giving the example of Abraham, and he's telling us that it's by faith, so that it's in accordance with grace, so that nobody can boast. So that we can't come to the cross of Jesus Christ, and we can't stand before God the Father and go, hey God, look at me. I'm pretty awesome, right? I did this this one time. I preached. Did you, did you see how I loved the people around me? And in sight of, in light of the gifts of God, there is no boasting for us. We don't get to go, we're awesome when we come to the cross of Jesus Christ. We get to come in humble obedience and humble awe that he would save a sinner like me. Like me. And friends, if the cross of Jesus Christ does not humble you, revisit the cross of Jesus Christ. 
I've often shared this with teenagers and people that I come in contact with, but the cross of Jesus Christ doesn't show you that you're awesome. It shows you that God is unbelievably loving. The cross of Jesus Christ is a great picture of just how much God loves sinners. And so it doesn't show us, look at us. It shows us, look at God. God is good. And the same thing is true for the love. We see this in 1 John 4, 7 and 1 John 4, 19. Beloved, let us love one another for love is from God and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. 1 John 4, 19, we love because he first loved us. I think it's important to note that he recalls really the conversation that Jesus had with Nicodemus when Nicodemus is coming and questioning and wondering, how do I get saved? And Jesus Christ tells him, you must be born again. And he goes, can I crawl back into the womb? How how am I supposed to do that? And what Jesus Christ is showing the Pharisee is this. He's showing him that, hey, how much credit you were able to take with your first birth, that's how much credit you're going to be able to take with your second birth. And I don't know about you guys, I had three sisters, same age, mom had four babies inside of her, she went through a lot, I can take absolutely no credit for that. I did not pop out and go, look at what I did. There was no boasting there. My mom went through eight months of holding four babies in her belly and then a whole lot of hospital visits and then there we were. And so who gets the credit for that? I got to look back to mom. Who gets the credit for me being born again? I got to look back to God. I got to thank God for that. And so faith and love are a gift of God. And this is really where I just want to spend the remainder of our time together because I think it'll be helpful for us. But when the gospel comes to Colossae, what it results in, and really what is the main thrust of this entire passage in these verses of 3 through 8, is that it results in Paul giving thanks. And so why does it cause Paul to give thanks? He gives thanks to him, as we've already addressed, because those two things are a gift. But I also want to spend some time with this with you for a second. Think about everything that the Apostle Paul is going through. He's writing this letter from a jail cell. He's probably already been beaten and treated horribly. False teachers are invading Colossae. In the midst of all sorts of turmoil, in the midst of an absolute mess, the Apostle Paul can give thanks. What is the difference between the Apostle Paul starting this letter off with thanksgiving versus complaining. If I'm in his shoes, just being honest in my flesh, I I could think of so many reasons to complain. The jail cell is not very nice. The the false teachers are going to Colossae again. I can't keep track of Philippi. Like all sorts of things that he could be complaining about. And the reason for thanksgiving over complaining is rooted in his perspective. What does the Apostle Paul choose to look at? The problem that is going on in Colossae, which he's going to address, or the provision that has been found in Jesus Christ. And over and over again, what the Apostle Paul looks at and looks to is the provision found in Jesus Christ. We have a wonderful case study of grumbling and complaining, as Mike led us through a couple weeks ago. When we look at the children of Israel, And they come out of Egypt and they're headed to the promised land. And do they find themselves full of thanks or full of complaints? Full of complaints. Cannot think of a more terrible people to shepherd than the people that Moses got stuck with. Because over and over again, they would not stop complaining. And the reason for it is that they weren't looking at the provision that God had provided from them and bringing them out of Egypt and towards the promised land, but they were always looking at the problem. They had a very nearsighted perspective. And friends, in the day and age we live in today, let me just say this, that it is so easy to get a nearsighted perspective. It's so easy to look at the world around us and go, look at that problem and look at this problem and look at that problem. And they're just keep piling up over and over again. But can I also tell you this, that there is a lot to be thankful for. 
if we just look at that reason to be thankful. And we look at this over here, and we look at what God did in their life. And so we can choose to be a church that's going to look at the problems, or we can be a church that looks at the provision that is found through the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I can tell you what kind of church I want to pastor. I can tell you what kind of Christian I want to be. My heart, I I want to be a Christian that is full of thanksgiving and not full of complaining. Because I know from my own experience, both being on the reciprocating end of it and the one giving it, that it, it, it gets tiring. Whether you're the one complaining or you're the one listening to it, it gets exhausting. And if we're not careful, we miss out on what God is doing. We miss out on the provision that is found in the good news of Jesus Christ. And so what do we see here? Let's just do a wrap up. But when the gospel comes to a people, my hope and prayer that this could be said of our church, that there would be epiphrases in our church, that in a year from now, two years from now, three years from now, that, that we could look back and we could look at what God did and we could look at where we started and we could look at where we've came and we could just give God all the glory and all the praise for His provision. And that we wouldn't go, look at what the board did, look at what Pastor Chad did, look at what that idea did, but they would just be, look at what the grace of God did as it was released on the island of St. Thomas. This is what I want for our church. But when the gospel comes to a people, we saw that it required a message, and it requires a messenger. Friends, we have the best message in the world to herald the best news in the world. And you can come debate me on that, but I'm not going to give you much leeway. Like there, there, there's just nothing you're going to say that's going to change my mind on that. It requires messengers. Are we willing to be those faithful messengers? Are we willing to be the epiphrases that just love the good news and love the people around us? And so we are going to be faithful to proclaim the gospel. It has to be heard. So homework for this week, share the gospel, like, but don't just speak it in a, in a closet somewhere or to your wall or you know, out to the ocean and just hope that maybe the echoes will carry it away. Make sure there's actually somebody listening. It's an important part of the gospel message. It must be understood, and I can guarantee this, that if we focus on the preaching and the making sure people hear it, God will take care of the understanding. We'll leave the results up to the Lord. And it gives people hope, it produces faith in Christ, and it gives us a love for the saints. This church will be as strong as it can be when we are focused on the gospel. Because out of the gospel and out of an eternal hope that is found in Jesus Christ, It both gives us that faith that we have in Christ, but it also gives us a love for one another. One of the ways I want to look at it is hope allows us to look forward. We get to pierce through everything that might be taking place right here, right now. But we get to look past it and go, we know what God is going to do. Faith takes us back. We look at what Jesus Christ has already accomplished on the cross of Jesus Christ. And love, it causes us to look around. So let me just encourage you in this, friends. If you're looking around today and there's a saint in this room that you don't have love for, check your heart. Go reconcile that relationship. And maybe it's because you're not looking far enough away. Maybe it's because you're not looking to hope. Maybe it's because you're looking at something that's so small. And it might be an issue right here and right now, but most of what we struggle with in our relationships, in our churches, in our marriages, in light of eternity, they're going to be that big. And that's probably not even small enough. So we've seen when Christ has first place in the life of the Apostle Paul. This week we've seen when the gospel comes to a people. And here's the secret. If we are people that have Christ as first place in our lives, in our marriages, and in our churches, then the gospel will come to the people of this island. That's a guarantee. 
If we love Jesus Christ more, if we put him in the proper spot of preeminence, we're going to be overflowing with the good news of Jesus Christ. And friends, I, I hope and pray from a year from now, we get to look back and say, look at what God did. Look at what God did. Will you please pray with me? Father, we thank you for the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I thank you that even while we were enemies of you, you showed us grace. When there was not a way, you paved a way. And I'm eternally grateful for that. I lift up this congregation to you. I pray that if Jesus Christ does not have first place in our congregation, in our hearts, in our lives, in our marriages, in our families, whatever it may be, that that would change today. I pray that you would faithfully use us as your ambassadors to bring the gospel to a people right here on St. Thomas, that you would get the glory and honor, that it would just be a bunch of crazy people talking about their wonderful Savior. We'll give you all of it, all the glory. And we thank you for the opportunity to serve you and for what you'll do in this place in the coming weeks and months and years to come. We pray this all in your son's perfect and holy name. Amen.